Um, so I'd like to uh, welcome everyone to the uh, One World Mind Seminar this week. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Kolda uh, speaking. She is a distinguished member of the technical staff at Sandia National Labs and is also a fellow of the Society for Industrial and Applied Mathematics, as well as for the Associate Association of Computing Machines. And if all that weren't enough, she's also a member of the National Academy of Engineering. Uh, so her papers in data science, high performance computing, and numerical linear algebra, uh, as well as tensor factorizations are immensely influential and have been cited over 21,000 times, according to Google Scholar this morning. Um, so I myself have enjoyed reading many of them and I'm incredibly happy to see what she has to talk about. Looking forward to it quite a bit. So I will um, stop babbling then and turn things over to, uh, to Dr. Calda to tell us what she's going to tell us about today. Thanks, Mark. And, and thanks to all the organizers for the chance to speak in this One World Mind Seminar. I've really enjoyed watching them and it's a pleasure to get to be a speaker this week. Uh, this is um, practical leverage-based sampling for low rank tensor decomposition. This is joint work with Brett Larson, who's, who's here online. You want to say hi, Brett? Hey, everyone. Uh, I worked with Tammy at Sandia, and I'm also a current PhD student at Stanford. Thanks. Uh, before I jump in, I'll say this is funded by the DOE Applied Math Program and the Advanced Scientific Computing Research Office. And then uh, Brett was also funded in part by the DOE Computational Science Graduate Fellowship administered by the Corel Institute. Uh, before I jump in, this is of course a time that's very different than a normal seminar. So I just want to take a, a moment to acknowledge that the turmoil that we're in we're all clearly impacted by COVID-19 with this online seminar being a direct result. But I also wanna especially acknowledge that a lot of our colleagues and our neighbors are in dire straits. Um, they're impacted in some cases by the Ill illness directly, but also with new pressures. Uh, many of our colleagues have childcare issues, issues of teaching online classes and just general stress, stress and anxiety. So I wanted to say, I just wanna acknowledge that. And then I think there's also a problem that we're realizing in the US and around the world around structural racism in our field. And I hope that we can all take time to individually learn more about the issues and collectively combat them to improve the field and the world as a whole. So I just want to take a moment to, to say that uh, and acknowledge just sort of what's going on in the larger world and to say that I'd like to be an ally for those who would like one. So let's get into tensors. So tensors come from many, many applications. Uh, they actually had a lot of work in chemometrics before it became popular in math, where it's useful for fluorescence spectroscopy, where you do emission by excitation measurements. If you have multiple samples, it turns out to be a way to discover what amino acids are in your samples. I've done work with another Stanford graduate student who's a friend of Brett's on uh, neuroscience, looking at multiple neurons imaged over time in multiple trials for a mouse running a maze. We've also looked at publicly available data on criminology, where we had data of the form, uh, a crime, a type of crime in a particular location for a particular day and hour. And this is sort of a heat map of where this group of crimes is committed. Uh, you can look at many applications in machine learning, including creating Gaussian mixture models using higher order moments. We've looked at taxicab data. There's New York City taxicab data. We can create a tensor that's pickup by drop off by time. I have a colleague who's looked at basketball data. You can look at cyber traffic networking data, social networking data, all types of signal processing data. You could look at co-occurrence data, many other things. The way that tensor decomposition is used in all these situations is to find patterns in massive data. So it's a form of unsupervised learning as sort of akin to principal component analysis. So what do I mean by uh, you know, unsupervised learning? So we have some data object, which is a tensor. And so it's a multi-way array. We're going to assume our multi-way array, in this case, has d plus 1 ways. So d plus 1 is the order of the tensor. It's size n1 by n2 by n3 and so on, up to n d plus 1. And what I mean is that each 
index, each entry of this data array is indexed by D plus one indices. So I1 through ID plus one. What tensor decomposition finds ultimately is D plus one factor matrices. So the kth factor matrix is size NK, where that's the size of the kth mode of the data tensor. And then all of them have the same number of columns, which is R, which we call the model rank, which is technically an upper bound on the model rank, but we just call it the model rank. So these factor matrices are used to approximate the data by turning them into a CP, what we call a CP model, where the columns, the corresponding columns of all the factor matrices are put together in an outer product. So this is the first columns of A1, A2, up through the last mode. And then we take the second columns and up through the last columns. And we add those all together. And we get a model that approximates the data. So this is a low rank model, very similar to low rank matrix decomposition. So the exact specifics of how you get each entry of the model is this formula here. But I don't want to like spend too much time on those details because those aren't actually important to the other stuff I have to say today. So I just put that there for reference. Before we get into how to compute this, I just want to give you an idea of the types of problems that we're targeting and what you can do. So we're going to look at a tensor that comes from Reddit. This is a online um, social news aggregation site in the US. Um, it does all kinds of things and it has what are called subreddits, which are basically discussion forms for a particular topic. So um, there's a group that launched this website called Frost, which is the formidable open repository of sparse tensors and tools. And so they created a tensor from the Frost data based on comments posted in the year 2015. And so the tensor is a three-way tensor. It has 8 million users, 200,000 subreddits, and 8 million words. There's a total of 4.7 billion non-zeros. And so the sparsity of this tensor is 10 to the minus 8 percent. So it's very, very sparse. Uh, despite that high level of sparsity, it still takes 106 gigabytes to store. So it's a big tensor and it's difficult to work with. Um, and then the exact um, IJK element of that tensor is the log of 1 plus the number of times user i used word j and subreddit k. So we actually transformed it to the log it was originally counts. And then we used a rank 25 decomposition. And so let me kind of show you what we get out of that. So we're going to compute a rank 25 decomposition. This is the norm of each of the components, so the relative sizes, just to give you a sense of the largest of the 25 components versus the smallest. And then I'm going to show you some of the components. I'm actually going to skip to the sixth component because on Reddit, people use a lot of foul language. And so we just, rather than censoring the language, we just are skipping to one that doesn't have uh, a foul language in, the, in what we're going to show you. So uh, I have these, comp these, com these vectors in the sixth component. So I'm going to kind of visualize these vectors. So this is the user vector. It has 8 million entries. I'm not going to show you 8 million entries. Um, I'm just going to show you the top 1,000 users so you can get a sense of how fast the interest drops off. Next, I'm going to show you the top 30 or so reddits or subreddits, and these are color coded by frequency. And so Ask Reddit is the one that's brown. That is the most frequent by such a wide margin that the next darkest color is dark blue. So it's all the way near the bottom. And so the darkest blue is the least frequent. And then um, I'm going to also show you the words. These are also color coded. And then we get a better distribution here. So the darkest are the most frequent. So like the word one is very frequent. Um, but country is very infrequent and world is very infrequent. So we like this color coding because it kind of shows us the words that are perhaps unique to that factor versus the common ones. So let me give you some of the components that pop out. So the one I was just showing you was on international news. And so we see the top subreddits are things like World News and Europe and United Kingdom and so on. That's why we said it's international news. And the top words, words include country and world are sort of unique words. Uh, I should say, you may notice that this is, these words are weird because they've been had stemming. So people stemming for whatever reason re removes the E. Uh, then there's relationships. I kind of like this one. It seems so nice. There's relationships, relationships advice. And the top words are relationships and friend and tell and someone and talk. 
So these seem nice. I don't know, I haven't looked at the Reddit, it might not be nice. Um, then they have a component, this is from 2015, I'll remind you from, uh, that seems to be on US politics. The second most popular subreddit is Sanders for President. The first one is politics, has things like state and vote. Then we have the component 11, which seems to be on a wide variety of sports. It has NBA and NFL and fantasy football and baseball and lots of different team names. And so we have team and player and fan coming up in this. And we got one on wrestling. So squared circle, when you do wrestling, you do it in a ring. I usually say you, it's in a wrestling ring, but it's actually a square ring. So it's the squared circle. And MMA is like a wrestling organization. You see match and wrestle and WWE, which is a wrestling organization is the top words. We got one for soccer specifically, sort of soccer, Red Devils, you can tell us in the US because they call it soccer, FIFA, Liverpool, lots of different team names and clubs and you see fan and club and league and player and team. So these are sort of references to that. And then we have movies and TV. This is sort of more science fiction-y. You see things like anime and Marvel Studios and movie and character. And then we have another one that is apparently about a computer card game called Hearthstone and maybe some related games and has like play and card and deck and game and player and win. So these are just some idea of the topics that you can find and you can quickly summarize this huge amount of data into some of the top topics that are discussed. All right, so that's sort of something that you can do with it, the type of unsupervised learning on a very large data set. And so to fit this model, remember we wanna find the factor matrices. The method that we're gonna focus on today is called alternating least squares. And the way it works is that it fixes all but one of the matrices and then gets the best solution for that matrix and then fixes all but the next, solves for that and keeps repeating, circling through all the factor matrices. And so each one of those subproblems is a linear least squares problem. And so that's gonna be our focus today is how to solve that linear least squares problem. And so we're gonna focus on solving for A, D plus one. And so the linear least squares problem you get looks like what we have here. We have our catchy rel product, which has, well, um, which I haven't told you what that is yet. So I'm gonna tell you that in a couple slides. So that's our matrix. Um, the size of that matrix is big N by little r. The big N is the size of the first D modes in our tensor. And just forming this matrix costs big N times r to form because of the catchy rao product structure. The B transpose is our matrix of unknowns, so it corresponds to the D plus first factor matrix. And then X transpose is actually the mode D plus one unfolding of our tensor X. And we are particularly concerned with the case where X is, is very sparse. Uh, and I should say little, the B is size R by little n, where little n is just the D plus first size. And then X transpose is, must be big N by little n. And then we kind of make this generic form because you can sort of switch exactly which modes you're solving for, but this basics re re becomes the same. So this uh, system would cost big N times little n times R squared to solve um, directly. It turns out because of the KRP structure, you can drop an R, but R is small. So we don't really worry about that. And I forgot to emphasize big N is really big. Um, and so I sort of have this dashed line so that you can think of this as very tall going way off the screen. Um, so you can reduce that to N times N times little R, but that's not a big difference. And then one big thing is that if this X is sparse, you can actually reduce the cost to R times number of non-zeros of X, which is a big savings. And so you would fairly ask, so what do we have to do here? It's, it's already solved. And that's true, it just makes it really hard to beat that. And so in the cases where you have billions of non-zeros, this is still too expensive because you actually have to solve this problem every sub iteration of your alternating least squares problem. And so if we can reduce this cost, this could be useful, especially for these very large scale problems. And so that's the, the problem that we're trying to solve. And I wanna stress that the, the tensor origins of this problem are largely irrelevant. So this actually, this catchy rail product structure appears in other situations. And so this could be useful in other contexts. So really our focus is on this problem independent of the fact that it came from a tensor problem. 
All right, so what is this KRP thing? This is the, the most important uh, defi part of our definition and the thing that we exploit throughout the talk. So if we take a KRP of D plus one matrices, each of these matrices has a different number of rows. So A1 has N1 rows, A2 has N2 rows, and they all have R columns. And we're gonna put them together to form this matrix Z where it has the number of its rows is the product of all the rows of these and the number of columns is the same. And then what you need to know is there is a one-to-one -one correspondent between each row of Z and a set of rows in A1 through AD. So it's, it's unique. Um, and it doesn't really matter exactly what that mapping is. I mean, there is an exact one, um, but it doesn't matter exactly what it is. You just need to know that it's one-to-one. -one. And what you do is you just multiply element-wise those rows together. And that's what gives you your i row. And so this is the exact formula that we use um, to go between i1 through id to uh, index i and z. And you can actually reverse this as well. And this just says that we multiply those rows. So that's, that's the key of what we want to do. So that's our KRP structure. And that's going to turn out to be useful. And I, another way that you can interpret this is each column of z is the Kronecker product of all the corresponding columns of the factor matrices. So that's another way to think of it. Okay, so we have our overdetermined system. And so we have a whole bunch of ingredients that we put together to get a practical solution to this. So our first ingredient is just to subsample. So we're gonna subsample full rows of the matrices Z and the corresponding rows of X transpose and weight them appropriately. And if we can do that, and this only has, um, and omega has um, only S rows and, and N columns to do the subsampling. Then we reduce our complexity from big N times little n times R to little s times N times R squared. And so this is potentially a big savings if S is much smaller than big N. So that's sort of the first step. We, we want to do that. And there's a lot of details about how to do it so you get a right answer and that's what we'll focus on. So how can we do the sampling so that the solution we get from the sampled system has any relationship to the solution of the full system. All right, so a first ingredient is just to make sure that you randomly um, sample in a way that gives you an unbiased solution. So for the sake of argument, just let me assume that I somehow have a probability distribution on the rows of the linear system, or the rows of Z, of, uh, Z so big N rows. So I have a probability distribution, so I have these p's that add up to one. I'm not yet telling you how these are specified. And then just for the sake of argument, suppose we just pick one random sample, and we're just gonna solve our system with one row. I'm not saying that you wanna do that, but this for the sake of simplification. So we'll call this one random row that we pick, we'll say it's indexed by xi. So we picked it with probability p sub xi. And then our omega matrix that we used to do our sampling will be a one by n matrix. So the number of samples is one. It's all zeros except for one entry, the zeth entry, which is one over the square root of the probability that we picked that element. And then if we look at the expectation of the sampled system, so omega z, if this is just a linear system alpha minus omega nu, um, this is equal to the probability of the full system. And we do this because we look at the probability that we picked row i, and then we plug in what we would get if we picked row i, and you can work out that this works out to the same thing. So this is what we call an unbiased estimator of the full thing. It has high variance, but it's unbiased. And then what we do in practice is we actually pick s random indices. So we pick s rows to work with. We weight it in a similar way um, if we pick index i for the jth row of our sample, then the weighting it gets is one over the square root of pi times the number of samples that we picked. And so each row has a single non-zero. I still haven't told you how to pick s, but we'll get to that. And then as before, you can prove that the expectation works out. So the way that you wanna pick these pi's is usually to depend on something called leverage scores. So let me tell you a little bit about what those are. So if you have your matrix Z that's big N by R, um, the leverage score for row I is defined as follows. You let Q be any orthonormal basis of the column space of Z. So you get that from a QR factorization or an S, the left uh, singular vectors of SVD. 
And then the leverage score of row i is the two norm squared of the um, ith row of q. And so this is necessarily in 0, 1. Uh, and you can define the coherence of the matrix Z as being the maximum leverage score. And so this coherence, the max it can be is 1. The smallest it can be is R over big N. And the rough intuition is that high leverage score rows are really important to your problem. So if we think of a system that has one column that has only a single non-zero, um, that one is really important. The leverage score will be one. And why is that? Well, we couldn't determine the value of alpha one without this row. So this row is very key to solving our least squares problem accurately. And so that's the rough intuition behind leverage scores. So it turns out that there's theory that ties the number of samples you need to the leverage scores. And so the number of samples you need is some function of the error epsilon. So it's order one over epsilon squared times log of R, which is the number of columns, times R times this magical beta inverse thing. And beta is this minimum of R times the probability of picking row I over the, the leverage score. So this is the connection between the probability of picking and the leverage score. So you want to pick, if your ideal situation is you make your beta to be equal to one, that's the maximum it can be. And that would happen if you chose your probabilities to be equal to leverage scores. But that requires computing them. So that's a bit of a problem. So suppose you just did uniform sampling. That's what most people try first. Um, so this means your probability of picking row i is just one over n for all i. If your matrix was incoherent, which means that the coherence was close to r over n, then this would say your beta is actually very close to one. You can, you can sort of work that out. And so your number of samples would just be order one over epsilon squares log r r. So this is, this is, this is good. Um, so if you are of an incoherent matrix, your life is much happier. If it's the extreme opposite, so your highest leverage score is one, then you're in some trouble. Your number of samples you're going to need, your beta will be r over n. And so the number of samples you're going to need is order n, big N. So it's actually bigger than the number of rows you have. So it's not going to really help you to sample. You need too many samples to get anything accurate. So, uh, so we'd rather, in the second case where we have a coherent matrix, pick the probabilities to be proportional to the leverage scores. But we can't actually compute those leverage scores because it costs too much. So this is our, our dilemma. Uh, as an aside, um, in past work, we've looked at, at um, doing um, what we call mixing on dense tensors. And so we take that same system and we apply a matrix phi to Z and X transpose before we do the random sampling so that we are guaranteed that these uh, matrices with high probability are incoherent, these, these changed matrices. So we choose our phi in such a way that um, phi times Z has approximately equal leverage scores on all the rows. So the beta is approximately one. Michael Mahoney calls this uniformizing the system. I kind of like that term, so I'm going to try and popularize it. Um, one way you can do this is by applying a fast johnson lindenstrauss transform, which is an FFT times a diagonal matrix of random plus minus ones on the diagonal. But the cost of that is still r n log n. And for our situation, we don't want anything that depends on big n. So that is a problem. We have looked at, instead of using phi as a FJLT, we have proposed a Kronecker fast johnson lindenstrauss transform. And so um, this actually applies the FJLT into, to the individual factor matrices before they are combined to form z. And we never explicitly form uh, phi times z. And it makes it much cheaper. So there's a whole bunch of details, which is in this um, 2018 paper. And then there's also some analysis, which has happened more recently, uh, joint with Ruhi Jin and Rachel Ward at University of Texas, showing that this Kronecker FJLT is indeed a fast johnson lindenstrauss transform. All right, so we can't do this for our sparse problems, because when we apply this FJLT to the sparse right-hand side, it becomes dense, and these problems are too large to do that. So, so that's why we kind of revisited this problem for the case was X was sparse. 
So what we can do is we can take some of the, one of the theorems from that old paper, and it's actually also co-discovered by another group that published in NIPS in 2016, um, to bound the leverage scores. So we can't compute this thing at cost order big N R squared to compute the leverage score of each row of Z, but we can bound it by the product of the leverage scores of the corresponding rows in the factor matrices. So remember, there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between I and these uh, set of indices I1 through ID. And this we can con cheap, compute very cheaply. It's just R squared times the sum of the number of these rows. And so this is a bound that we can use. And we're gonna use this to determine our sampling probabilities. So I'll show you our, our main result. So we have this linear system that we want to solve. And the Z in our system, the, the matrix has catcher rail product structure. We're gonna define our sampling probabilities to be proportional to the product of the leverage scores of the factor matrices, where each I here has a corresponding one-to-one -one mapping to a set I1 through ID, as we sort of mentioned down here. These are those leverage scores. Now we're doing the leverage scores for each factor matrix. So Q sub K is the orthonormal, orthonormal basis for A sub K. Um, and then we can compute its leverage scores. And then we do a random matrix sampling where we pick S indices with the probability of picking index J equal to C sub J. And then we can build the um, sampling matrix as before. So this will pick out rows of Z and weight them appropriately. And then we'll solve our subsampled problem and we'll get some solution, we'll call it uh, B star and then we'll put a tilde on top to say that it's from the sampled problem. And then what we can say uh, with high probability, so with probability at least one minus delta, if we plug this B tilde star back into our original system, the solution, the residual we get will be within one plus epsilon of the best possible residual. So this is telling us how good is this solution to our approximate problem. And then the question is how many samples do we need? So in this case, the number of samples we need can be bounded by order R to the D log N divided by epsilon squared. So ideally when R is small, this is much, much, much smaller than big N, which is approximately N to the D. Uh, just a quick question, if that's sure. uh, okay. Um, Absolutely. Uh, if you approximately solve for B tilde, that's not going to break anything here, I'm assuming. Um, if, you, if you have an approximation for the, the least squares problem and then you plug that back in, nothing changes? Oh, I actually don't know. That's a good question. Okay. I guess it depends on what approximate solution method you use. So we're combining approximate solution methods. I, I suspect you could kind of add, kind of include those bounds and work it in. Yeah, I would imagine if this, um, if this smaller least squares problem were still big, you might still use an approximate method to solve it and then mm -hmm. have an approximate solution. So I was wondering if that breaks anything with the, the rest of the result. But I think if you can, can bound that, then you can use this to bound the, the formula. Okay, all right, I, I was assuming so, thanks. Yeah, good question, thank you. Great, and so if there's any other questions too for the Q&A, please feel free to post them from the audience. I'm happy to, to take questions at any point. Um, all right, so we're up to four ingredients. We have about five more. So this is sort of the main result, how many samples you need. All right, so even once you have all this bounds, you actually don't want to figure out the leverage scores for all big N rows. That would be quite expensive to do. And so that would still be big N work. We don't want to do that. So instead, we're going to actually sample according to this probability here without actually ever computing it. And so the way that we do that is we sample independently from each factor matrix. So we sample a row from A1 according to the probability to its leverage score, a row from I A2 according to its leverage score, and a row from ID according to its leverage score. We put those together and appropriately weight it to get the ith row of our sampled Z without ever forming Z. And so that's, that's sort of a way of avoiding forming this big matrix. All right, so um, the next thing we do is that when we're doing this sampling based on leverage scores, one thing that can happen 
is you find that a few of the rows are very important and have high leverage scores and most don't. And then you have many, many repeats. So for example, one of the problems we looked at, it had 10 to the 12th rows. We were looking at two to the 17th samples. Can I interrupt one more time? Sure, absolutely. Uh, just quickly about the last slide, uh, Holger Rahut would like to know whether this exponential scaling in D can be um, removed. You had mentioned, I think, one slide. Yeah, can the, can the exponential scaling in D be removed? We hope so, but not so far. Okay. So I, I would love to talk offline or maybe at the end, uh, ask that again. All right, thanks. Mm -hmm. uh, so what happens is we have um, uh, repeated, uh, so with this problem where we had 10 to the 12 rows and two to the 17 samples, and we set our cutoff uh, for what we consider to be high to just be one over S, so 10 to the minus six approximately, how many of our samples are above that threshold? And it's 15,000. And those 15,000 out of 10 to the 12th make up 51% of the probability. So this means when you take a sample, these 15,000 will just be over and over again in that sample of two to the 17th entries. This will be half of it. So this is, um, becomes a problem. And we see it in other examples too. And this gives you sort of an idea of the distribution of these top 15,000, 10,000, and 7,000 probabilities. So the top few are very, very high. And so one thing you can do is combine the repeated rows before you do your QR solve or whatever your solution method is for your least squares problem. So it's okay to have repeated rows, but you can actually just go ahead and combine them it, before you do the next step. And it actually is just a big practical savings. Um, another thing you can do is, you know, you have these high probability rows. Why don't we just include those high probability rows deterministically? So we'll just call D sub tau the set of all rows that have probability bigger than some threshold. We usually set it equal to just one over the total number of samples we're gonna take. Um, and let that, be the first set of rows here. And then let's let P sub debt be the sum of all those probabilities. So in some cases, those are very high. And then the rest of the rows will be randomly selected. And so there's a couple tricky things here. One is we don't wanna compute all the probabilities. So on the next slide, I'm gonna tell you how we find these high probability things without computing all the probabilities. And then once we remove those, you can't just remove them from a list because we're not sampling directly from a list. We're sampling in this funny way where we sample one uh, row of each factor matrix at a time. So we had to do what's called rejection sampling, where we sample a potential row and we reject it if it's in our deterministic rows. And so we keep sampling until we get one that's not here. And then we had to sort of rescale the probability that we selected it because we took out these deterministic ones. And then we add an appropriately weighted row here. So a little care is necessary, but then we have this hybrid sampling method and it should, re it should uh, result in a better set of samples here because there's not so many of a few, few rows being repeated over and over again. And so the last piece is combining, uh, finding all the high probability rows without actually computing all the probabilities. So we wanna find all the probabilities that are above some specified threshold without actually computing all of them. And so what we do is we sort those probabilities or leverage scores in each of the, for each of the factor matrices. And then we look at say the top scores in the, first, the second and third columns. And then we say, well, we'll cut off here whenever this times the very top entries in these two gets less than tau. And so that's something that we can do to find a cutoff here. Anything below here times the biggest two entries won't be bigger than tau, so there's no point in even looking at it further. And we do the same for this one and the same for this one. And then we only have to look at combinations of these top few probabilities. And so that's, that's what we're doing to sort of find our deterministic rows. And we actually uh, talked about this previously and someone pointed us to some work that might even speed this up uh, and is maybe a smarter method than what we're using. And so uh, we're open to that. And this is also potentially where we might be able to find some if we can do all this efficiently, find some reduction in that R to the D. All right, so the last piece is, you know, we've now know how to sample the rows of Z. And we last thing we have to do is get the corresponding rows of, of this X. 
So we never want to form this unfolded matrix at all. Um, and moreover, it's actually really hard to go through and find these D plus one matching indices. That's a lot of work. For every non-zero, we have to compare all of these to our targets from the, what we selected. So we actually pre-compute what we call linear indices for every non-zero and every mode. So we only have to match up one. And then, then we can get our sparse right-hand side for the sampled data. It's still sparse um, even when it's sampled. All right, so let me give you some of our numerical results in the last few minutes. So first I'm gonna show you how the solution quality improves when you do these hybridized samples that we mentioned. So we're gonna look at our sampled system. We're gonna look at a problem that has 46 million rows, 10 columns and 183 right-hand sides. And so we're gonna call B tilde star the best solution of our sampled problem. And then B star is the best solution of the original problem. And so we're gonna look at the residual, the difference in the residuals um, compared to uh, uh, just appropriately normalized. And so you can ignore the one because they're, they're, I think, always bigger than one. So, um, so the normalized difference in these residuals. So if we just do the standard um, random method where we pick a proportional to these leverage scores, we see the curve in red and, and these sort of, um, these bars around it is, is we did a bunch of trials. And so we see that as you increase the number of samples, this relative residual difference goes down. And so it gets less than 10 to the minus three as you get up to about four times or five times 10 to the fifth samples. When we do this hybrid approach, um, it's never worse than just doing the straight random approach because it reverts to that um, if there's no uh, high, high uh, probabilities. But in some cases it can be significantly better. And this is one of those cases where the hybrid approach gets a much more accurate solution because it's more economical in its samples. So it uses more of them to get more diversity in, in the samples that it takes. And so this is the benefit of this proposed hybrid approach. But just to give you a sense for this particular problem, how many um, repeated, uh, how much probability was in a concentrated in a few columns, uh, starting at two to the 11th sample. So we set our cutoff tau to be one over the number of samples. So this is the number of samples. At two to the 11th, we see that about 3% of our samples contain about you know, 5% of the overall probability. By the time we get to the two to the 19th, 15% of the samples contain 90% of the probability, which meant that you know, only 15% of their samples would actually make up 90% of our overall samples. So there's a lot of repeats, but it's kind of wasted samples. And so uh, we want to avoid that happening. And so this hybrid method is a way to do that. Now, you don't get this for free. There's a tiny bit of extra cost in finding these, um, these deterministic samples and doing the rejection sampling. We think maybe we can cut this down, but this is just the regular random method, how much it costs for this solution as we increase the number of samples. And then here's the hybrid. So you can see this blue bar, this sort of stage where we're doing the sampling, it goes up in expense. Um, but it's not, a big, it's not a big difference. And we'll see in the runs, there's actually not much difference between these. All right, so let me, oh, I took out that slide. All right, you won't see in the runs, in the paper. We have runs that compare these two methods overall, and uh, they are uh, basically the same in terms of overall time. All right, so let me kind of give you the results on these really big tensors. So we have, uh, there's another tensor on frost called the Amazon tensor. It has 1.7 billion non-zeros. It's 4.8 million by 1.8 million by 1.8 million. So it's a three-way tensor. We did a rank 25 CPD composition using just the standard alternatingly squares method. And, um, and if you, what we're showing here is in these purple lines are 10 individual runs of the CP ALS method. Each dot here is one outer iteration. So that would be three least squares solves. And we have 10 individual runs and the slightly thicker line in the middle is the median of these runs. So you can get an idea of how that works. It takes about seven and a half hours for each of these runs. And the best fit it got was 
um, the relative error sort of compared the model and the data is 0.3396. So basically 34% of the data is explained by the model. So that's the standard method. So this big tensor with 1.7 billion on zeros. If we use this leverage score sampling method, it's reduced by a factor of approximately 10x. And so we show here for the blue is two to the 17th samples and the red is two to the 16th. Um, they get approximately the same fit as one another and approximately the same as the standard method. And in fact, the hybrid method does even just slightly better. And this takes only 43 minutes to run. And the main reason it's faster than the one with less samples is it converges a bit faster. So it finds the solution more quickly with the more samples, it gets a more accurate solution at each step. So this sort of this trade off. Um, and so this is a huge uh, difference in the computational time. And we can pretty consistently get good results. Also have you noticed that the results for the CPALS, it's always improving the fit. You're guaranteed that you improve the fit at each iteration. With these randomized methods, the fit can wiggle back and forth as you're getting a, a sort of a random solution. So that makes it a little bit harder to detect when it's time to stop. Um, and, and so that's maybe the trickiest thing about using these random methods. It gets up to something near the solution very quickly. And then I'll go next to the Reddit tensor. So this is the one that we showed the example of at the beginning. So this has 4.7 billion non-zeros. It's a, it takes 106 gigabytes to store. It size is 8.2 million by 0.2 million by 8.1 million. And if we run this, I think this is 10 runs. Brett, you can tell me if I'm wrong. It's, is it 10 runs here? Oh, you're still muted. Right, so while Brett's getting unmuted, it's, it's 96 hours per run of this on a dedicated, very high- Sorry, I'm here. Computer. Go ahead. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, it's 10 runs on, on both of those. Yeah. Um, so I'll also interject. Someone has asked what the, the fit means here that we might want to clarify. Uh, okay. Yes. So the fit means here, this is the amount of the data explained. So it's the, it's the, um, the data, the, the sum of squared errors of the data uh, minus the model, the square root of that divided by the square root of the norm of the data. So the sum of squares of all the, of the data. Yeah, and also the on these uh, randomized runs, it's an estimated fit so that we're plotting. So that's an additional reason why it's it's jumping around because we're estimating it based on some samples. Oh, I forgot to mention that. Yes, thank you. Um, so this is 96 hours per run. So I always like to give credit to Brett for running this code 10 times at 96 hours per run. There's a number of things like MATLAB licenses timing out and so forth that was, and, and you know, Q, the, the cluster didn't let it run for 96 hours and things like that. So, so this was a big effort just to get these runs to compare to. The sketching based method, this random sampling based method is 12 times faster. So it's only eight hours per run. It gets essentially the same, same fit. And yeah, I, I forgot to mention that these fits, one of the ways that we save time with the sketching method is use a method that's already uh, been used in the, some of the past work, which is to just estimate the fit at each step. And the reason we don't do that for CP is it actually gets the fit for free based on the solving of a least squares problem. So it's like, it doesn't cost it anything extra to compute the full fit. All right, so we get these big speed ups. So that's sort of the whole of the work. So the paper is on archive. So the question we wanted to answer was how do we make CP density composition faster for large scale sparse tensors? And so the hopeful answer is matrix sketching, uh, but we ran into a number of, of problems when we tried to practically implement this. Uh, one of them was how, one of the bigger ones is how to avoid repeats in the sampling. And so there's sort of two methods that you can do and you can even combine them, which is to combine repeated rows or deterministically include high probability rows and then just sample among the remainder. Um, and then we have to be careful about our sampling. So you never wanna compute all the probabilities. You never wanna compute the full matrix. And so the way that we do this is we sample independently from each factor matrix to build up our sampled version of our Cauchy Rao product. And then we also have to be careful about how we extract data from the right-hand side uh, that's actually currently one of the most expensive parts of the overall solution. And so um, 
we will probably look into ways to make that more efficient, especially if we do something in C++. If we haven't done, I don't think we've done the timing runs yet, but one look at this building up the sparse matrix in MATLAB, I think is what's kind of killing us. Um, but the, even with all that, we're still getting order of magnitude speed ups based to the standard method, which just cost um, something proportional to the number of non-zeros and the tensors at each step. And you know, this is just an op opening salvo. There's still many, many open problems. Uh, how to pick the number of samples. We found that two to the 17th just seems to work good, but we have no idea why. So we get this theoretical result, but those are always a little bit divorced from reality. They're more like guidance. Um, how to pick this deterministic threshold for samples to include. Uh, how to have better stopping conditions because we have this bit of randomness and we're also estimating the fit. Um, we could also potentially sample based on the, the data tensor X as well as the catchy route product. And of course, we're at, at Sandia always interested in parallelization of the, of the methods. So I wanna thank you for attending today and for any questions you might have. Thanks. Yeah, thanks a lot for, uh, for giving a talk for us today at the One World Mind Seminar. So just a reminder to all of the attendees that uh, you can post questions using the, the Q&A uh, tool at the bottom of your screen. Um, and uh, I'd like to open it up to see if any of the um, uh, panelists have any questions before we uh, go into go to the Q&A. So I had a quick question about um, the Chronicle product. I mean, sure. it seems like, you know, that uh, the cost is, uh, you're paying the cost in this R to the D uh, that shows up. Does it also show up in the error bound at all or is it completely absorbed in the dimension? So you're asking how does the number of samples affect the error bound? Is that? Well, I, I guess what I'm worried about is that because you're chronicling or you know capturing our producting uh, individual things, that your your performance is going to be uh, is possibly going to be affected by the worst possible one of these uh, things that you're essentially tensoring. Uh, so I'm wondering if that's showing up in the error bound at all, or just uh, just in the number of yeah, so I mean, we kind of, uh, we sort of set that they want the error to be epsilon and then that affects the number of samples. In practice, oh. we pick the number of samples and then we see what error we get, so. There's also a probability. Right, that probability, this, this delta, the probability of being successful, it doesn't have a huge effect because it's in the log. So it's, you can assume it's kind of high and. So maybe what he's thinking about gets affected through this like misestimation factor in the sense, because that's going to be determined by chronicling these these probabilities together. So yeah. maybe what you're thinking about is like you know if you have a really concentrated row that, or a really concentrated factor that could affect the whole thing. That's where we're hoping that maybe some some brilliant person will come along and, and show that we can get a better bound there. Mm -hmm. Especially with the deterministic, maybe by pulling out it's these high leverage scores that that we think cause this bound to not be so great. So maybe by pulling those out, there's a possibility of getting theory that says that that's not only practically good, it's also theoretically good. Yeah, because we know in the worst case, that's one over R to the D minus one, right? So we, we do know that that's where that's popping up. Good, uh, I have a quick question about, I think it was slide 27. Um, you said you are, uh, where you are pre-computing the indices of the non-zero entries of, of X, I think. Um, possibly, yeah, so that you, when you did your sampling, you could find out which, um, which rows of X you were gonna pick. Mm -hmm. So are you, uh, are you actually going through all of X and sort of, um, looking at all of the non-zero entries to begin with, or did I misunderstand? Yes, yeah, we're gonna look at everything to begin with. So you, you could imagine hmm. schemes yeah. where you subsample from that before you start anything. But, but we're looking at everything ahead of, at, at making a couple passes ahead of time. Okay, I, so I have a really dumb question, uh, I guess. <laughs> um, instead of, uh, so when you're looking through this giant sparse tensor, um, couldn't you, uh, couldn't you effectively make a, a dense, I don't want to say make a dense copy because I know that's not a good idea, but um, effectively just remember where the non-zero entries are 
uh, or make a dense copy and then just work, just uh, do your least squares problem on the, on only the non-zero entries somehow. Um, and then map, map the answer back because you know you've approximated the non-zero entries and if you know where they came from, you can map them back in your estimate. I mean, it's a, it's a very stupid idea. Maybe you don't have the memory for it, but it's just. Yeah, so the, the zeros are, we're still, even though we don't store the zeros, they actually are still happening in the calculation, if that makes sense. So they're, they're still relevant, even though it's, a, it's sparse. So they're kind of still being in, included in that big old solution. So if you had missing data, if those zeros actually represented missing data, I see. what you propose, I, I'd have to think about it, but that, that could potentially be. Yeah, I was just thinking about reducing uh, L2 norms, in which case approximating anything that's zero at all is sort of something you don't really care to do. <clears throat> well, it's, it's not zero because it's a difference between that zero and the model en estimate, which might be non-zero. Uh, uh, yeah, okay, yep. That's, yeah, I guess, so it's, it's okay. Maybe, we, maybe offline or something. It was, uh, it would, you would be like learning a sparse model somehow if you just ignored the zeros, but I guess if they could be missing data or something, that probably doesn't make sense. Also, my question is probably just dumb. <laughs> Um, okay, great. Uh, let me see. Um, uh, so there was a related question um, uh, from an anonymous attendee about what kind of memory you use to store all the data, how, uh, how easy it is to access. Um, I was, I was going to mention, because I think they're asking like how much memory it requires, and it's actually this pre-computing the linear indices that you end up having to store essentially a full, something that's a equivalent of like a second copy of the tensor where you have like something for each mode. So whatever your tensor is, you're gonna need double that plus um, some extra, extra memory to do these computations. We did the biggest ones on about one terabyte of RAM, um, which you probably didn't need all of that, but they were, they were on some pretty, pretty hefty nodes. Yeah, great. That is good. Uh, Holger Rahut has uh, a question. Um, I've allowed him to talk. Holger, if you can, un you can unmute yourself if you want and uh, ask your question. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. ah, okay. Um, yeah, so I actually have two questions. So, so one is, would it make sense to use selectors to actually uh, draw the rows at random, so um, decide for each row um, using a Bernoulli random variable, uh, whether you take it or not. Um, of course, this may, may, and you may, it may be more difficult to, to compute the probabilities, but. Uh, so I, I was looking this? at your question. And so I think the short answer to it is there, so you could do this and the probabilities actually aren't hard to compute. It's just you would have to draw basically a random variable for every row of the Katri row product, which is order n, which would just take way longer than what we're doing of drawing, you know, say s rows. So the number of samples that we want to draw is so much less than like the number of Katri row product rows that if you had to draw this for each of the individual rows, and it, you can think of it, you're, you have to basically draw a selector for every possible combination of rows in your factor matrices. Okay, I understand. Yeah, uh, and and the second question is, um, maybe I missed this, but do you actually cycle through all these AIs um, basically, so that uh, at some point um, each AI takes the role of of the A D plus one at some point? Yes, exactly. Okay, so the D plus one is just. Uh, like, I mean, you do the same thing for all the AIs. Right, there'd just be a different set of factor matrices that make up the Z. And then the unfolding of the, of the tensor into the right-hand side would be different. Okay, thanks. Uh, so um, Alexander uh, Litvinenko has a couple questions. Uh, I've given you the ability to speak if you wanna unmute yourself and, and ask. Yes, thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Uh, warm greetings from Aachen, Germany. Thank you very much for nice talk. Uh, two questions. Um, why CP format? Did you try some other tensor formats? And maybe each problem requires 
some particular tensor format which fit very well for this problem. Thank you. Uh, so it's great to hear your voice. Um, so do you mean like as opposed to a, a tensor train format or a Tucker format? Was that your question? Yes, for slide? example. Yes, uh, for example. Yeah, so I, I find that CP format is the best for explainability and, and sort of data exploration. Uh, it's easier to understand. It has some uniqueness properties. So, I, but I think, you know, many of these ideas could potentially be translated to these other settings. And did I, I think you had a second question. I'm not sure I, I quite got it. I think it. Second question is, um, um, so you gave some example with uh, Amazon data sets, with Reddit data set, but do you know any work where similar analysis was applied for uh, anal analysis in genetics, uh, this analysis of DNA sequences? which consists only on four symbols, A, C, T, G. Thank you. So I, I don't, and if I, but I would be definitely curious if you know of something like that, that would be very interesting. Okay, thank you. Uh, excellent, thanks a lot, guys. There's one more question from um, uh, Kyle James Gilman, uh, who asks, since the leverage scores are computed from the factor iterates in uh, ALS, does the sampling strategy significantly affect convergence of the algorithm? Are initialization effects worse or the same? Um, yeah, let's see. Uh, well, I was going to give the example of the Enron tensor and how it was okay. worse. <laughs> uh, so we actually ended up with it. So there's this aspect of these, these sketching algorithms where they're also a part of your solution is how much of like the range of e or how much of of the right hand side is in the range of your matrix and when you start out with these random factor matrices for some tensors this could be very small and you get bad performance at the beginning and even bad convergence and so if you look in our paper there's an example on uh, an enron tensor from frost where we had to actually use the the randomized range finder initialization method where we initialized our factor matrices Base from the, from the ra random combinations of the unfoldings of the tensor. If you if you did that, you got much better convergence than if you just did a random initialization. So there are effects actually from using this sketching where this random initialization works fine for CPALS in this case, but you have to use this more specialized technique for um, our randomized algorithm. And I'll just I'll add that this is this part that your, your least squares can't fit, that causes the headaches. Yeah. So if you think of AX minus B, there's this sort of, often it's called like B perp, this part that your, your, least, your, your least squares can't capture, which is, you know, you hope that it doesn't even exist, but so if that, if that exists, the effect of the randomized sampling on that is very hard to predict. It's just sort of a loose cannon out there. Uh, excellent. So, um... It looks like we've exhausted the questions. If there are any last Perfect timing. <laughs> questions, yeah, feel free to uh, quickly hop in with them. I have one quick one, I guess. Uh, I was just wondering, is there anything to be gained by uh, kind of uniformizing on a, a you know, a dimension by the, so you've got these AIs, you go and you uniformize A1 by doing something like a Hadamard uh, with a diagonal, and then you do the same for A, A2, A3, et cetera. And then uh, you form your. Absolutely, absolutely. So that's what we do in the paper with Casey Battaglino and, and Gray Ballard. Um, that's referenced earlier. Yep, absolutely. Uh, there's some like tricky stuff to handle the right hand side on that as well. But it, if it's a sparse right hand side, we have we, it becomes dense is the main issue. But otherwise, I, I well, Brett is actually doing a shootout between the two methods. So to, to BD, by the time we finish the submit the paper, that will be done. Yeah, it's unclear on dense sensors what exactly happens because you can't do it on sparse sensors. But essentially, I mean, like what we think right now happens is the leverage method is a little bit faster because you don't have to do the mixing. But for the same sample number, you tend to get um, few, you tend to get worse, slightly worse convergence. So you'd probably have to use, you know, it, in some case it'll depend on the tensor. But you know, some cases it could be a draw. The lore is that, I think the lore is that uniformizing works better. Yeah, so yeah, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks.
Great. Um, okay. In that case, I will uh, thank you one last time. So thanks again for an excellent talk. And uh, I will hopefully uh, see everyone back here and uh, either as an attendee or a speaker uh, next week. Thank you again for the opportunity. It's great. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks a lot for, for, for talking. It's, it was uh, excellent. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.